telling you he's big as two. He's too darn lazy to reach down and tie his shoe. He weighs a third of a ton, this big fat son of a gun, yes. Talk about your lazy fare, he's too inert to even care. Mm. Watch him while he's sitting there, look at that. Chunks of fat hang round from his chair. Oil just oozing from his hair. Fat and greasy as a bear. Boys, that man is fat and greasy. How to cool is fat and greasy. Hit the heel is fat and greasy. A big fat greasy food. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, my name is Daniel, and in this very hastily thrown together video, I want to talk a bit about three Monish lizards that I cut open recently and do a bit of general speculating about fat in Monish lizards. First, I want to emphasize that these animals I've cut open came from a very experienced keeper, and so they really represent the top end of Monish lizard husbandry. They're not great big, very obese animals like the ones in the introduction. But were they overweight? That's the question. So, monish lizards can convert stored fat to water or energy. Um, they can use the energy for running about, the females can use it to make eggs. We know from observations in captivity that female monish lizards use fat in the tail base shortly before egg laying. You know, the whole tail base sort of collapses and that energy presumably goes into eggs. But how they use the fat in the body isn't as obvious. Species that are seasonally inactive presumably use it to survive these long periods without food and water, but how it's used in reproduction really remains a bit of a mystery. So what I did was I took three dead captive biowack and I had a poke about inside and I took some very basic measurements. And the aim wasn't to determine how they died, because obviously that needs lots of training and knowledge that I don't have, but really just to describe the size and condition of the major organs as far as possible and to show how you recognise and remove them. In fact, the first and the third biowax that I looked at were killed by other monitor lizards, and only the second one was an unexplained death. Right, so first of all, it helps to know what species we're dealing with. Um, the clearly Verona Salvatore group, they're all lumped together in the 1940s, but now every time a new student looks, more species get split off. But in real terms, biowax are very good at dispersing, and they get all over the place, so there's plenty of opportunity for interbreeding among species that live within swimming distance of each other. And swimming distance, you know, is probably a lot further than you'd imagine it probably would be. So the head of the first one that I looked at looks a bit like Varanus Kumingai from southern Philippines to me, but overall I wouldn't have recognised it immediately. <clears throat> In fact, one of the parents was said to come from Frankfurt Zoo, and the room would be from Zamboanga, in Mindanao, and the other one was a other parent was an unrelated Kamingai. In life, it looks like a very, very spectacular Veranus Kamingai. In after a few months in the freezer, it didn't look so good. But is Kamingai one species, and are the north coast Mindanao animals the same as the ones way down south? How do we know? Is this Kamingai or is it a hybrid animal? And it's really a problem that applies throughout captive bred populations of monitor lizards. There's very few of them are likely to represent natural races. And of course, there's no, document there. there's no documentation and there's an awful lot of bullshit when it comes to their origins, especially the high value ones. There are exceptions, but there aren't very many. And it's a real shame because a lot of them are small island endemics that would benefit from captive breeding. But there you go, it's really all about the money with this business, and that means that animals that are brighter and more spectacular than the ones normally found in nature are the ones that people are interested in, like leopard geckos and pythons. It's not really reached that stage yet with monish lizards, but it's coming. If you're from the Philippines, you might have noticed that the kids in Europe and America are breeding your monish lizards and making plenty of money from it. So why isn't anybody in the Philippines breeding them? Yawa! Anyway, I won't bother with that here because we don't have a definite way of identifying these animals to a specific level. The keys don't work very well, so I'll just call them bioax. So in summary, these bioax we cut open are 12 to 19% body fat. They've got livers that weigh 1.6 to 5% of their overall body weight. And how does that compare to wild bioax and other monitor lizards? 
So a bit of background, Fat Bodies first recorded in Monolith Lizards back in 1861 when Gunther described the anatomy of a Varanus exanthematicus which lived at London Zoo for six months and it was fed on meat and eggs. And it got fat bodies that were 20% of its overall mass. Now if we look at data from wild exanthematicus, which mainly come from a series collected in every month of the year in Senegal, the fat bodies peak at about 4% of overall weight. Three that I've looked at in Ghana also contained about 3% fat, so it sounds accurate. And in Senegal, these animals are fasting from January to June. So this 4% fat is really what keeps them alive during that period. Might be very different for Varanus albigularis, because in Namibia, huge drops in body mass have been recorded over the dry season, which suggests that they might have an awful lot more than this 4% fat that the exanthematicus needs to survive four to six months of not eating. In 1912, uh, Sterling recorded finding bright yellow fat bodies in a 7.7 kilo Varanus giganteus that had been kept at the National Museum for three months, and it hadn't eaten anything. It refused to eat. So you notice that it, its vigour was dwindling, although when they got excited, tormented probably, they showed themselves still capable of active and powerful movement. Anyway, so he ended up killing it and he weighed the fat bodies and the fat bodies in that were 12% of its total weight. He noticed that they were similar to the fat bodies in amphibians and suggested that they had some relation to the sexual activities. And he also said that it was reasonable to suppose that they might serve as reservoirs of fat to be utilised during hibernation. But if so, it was remarkable that they were still so big after the animals hadn't eaten for three months. In Pianka's book, which was published 92 years later, basically repeats exactly the same information that Sterling had given about fat bodies, together with the note that knowledge of these fat bodies is incomplete. Yeah, you're not kidding. So, there were, in 1922 and 1937, there were preliminary studies of the fat in Sri Lankan Bioact that looked at the different component fatty acids. That was never followed up. I think that's the only work that's been done on it. And in the 1940s, Robert Mertens recognised that spiny-tailed monitors of the Odatria subgenus stored fat in the tails and that the tail could uh, reduce by two-thirds of the diameter if you starved the lizards. So as far as the quantity of fat in wild biowax is concerned, there's really very little data indeed. There's excellent data on the reproductive organs taken from leather farms in Sumatra, but not much about the fat. And in that one, they examined 166 bioax, and they gave each bioac a fat body score from 0 to 3, according to the size of the fat bodies. But they don't give the criteria for scoring, so there's really no way of working out how big they were. They didn't find any difference in the size of fat bodies between males and females, and the scores varied, although it doesn't say how, according to when they visited the uh, lizard skinners. And that was about all the information. Walter Offenberg described fat bodies in Bhutan, Varanus olivaceus, and in Bioax from southern Luzon in the Philippines, and he also described them from Bengalensis in different parts of the range. So he uses two values. He uses the overall percentage of fat for some, and also the grams of fat divided by the snout vent length in centimetres for others. Well, I think Walter's proofreaders were asleep or on drugs or something, so some of the text about fat in his book in Bengalensis is clearly wrong, but the graphs are probably right. So here's the data for Bhutan on the left and Biowak on the right, and it's expressed as grams of body fat divided by snout vent length in centimetres. And you can see that Bhutan follow quite a clear pattern with the least fat in July, the most fat around October and November. Also, that males have got a lot more fat than females, and he gives a maximum value of 12% of body weight for fat in that species. He also describes the weight of fat at different times of year for bioac in the same region. And all the animals apparently bigger than 40 centimetres snout bent length categorised by sex. And in them, the females have got more fat, and there's no obvious seasonal pattern with animals having lots of fat or no fat at all at different times of the year. And the maximum value he gives is 2 for males and 2.2 for females. So <clears throat> the animals that we dissected, if you look at the fat in the same terms, 
the animals I dissected have got um, the big animal I dissected has a value of 9.1, which is sort of four, so nearly five times higher than the maximum value he's recorded for wild bioax. And the other two have got also much higher than average values. And you can also see that the bioax have got a lot less fat than the Bhutan. So I'd be wary of using Offenberg's data as a direct comparison with other races of bioac because my experience of bioac in forests where Bhutan lives is that they're a real skinny sickly bunch overall they're not big and strong like um, bioac in mangroves for example these are lots of frogs they even eat cane toads and they tend to be absolutely full of parasites anyway so for bengalensis Offenberg gives fat content as a percentage of body mass and there's a clear peak towards the end of the year the fattest animals are about 14 percent fat but the average value given is 1.8% males and 2.1% for females. So there's not really that much fat in them. Another very striking thing about this fat in captive animals is that it's white. I've spoken to other people who've cut open captive monster lizards this week, and they all say it's white as well. But in wild monster lizards, fat's always bright yellow, almost orange. So here's fat from Varanus exanthematicus, and then fat from Varanus caroliverans, and if you compare that with the fat from captive, you can see it's a completely different colour, so maybe it's beta carotene that makes the fat yellow, I'm not sure, but it, it really seems to be different fat. So wild animals have clearly got this seasonal pattern where they accumulate fat, and then they metabolise it, and then they accumulate more, and then they metabolise it, but in captive animals this probably doesn't happen. You can imagine female monitor lizard metabolising body fat to produce lovely clutches of eggs. But what a male could do with all that fat, it's not really clear. And in practical terms, having this much fat in the body cavity, it doesn't leave space for much else. And in the one that's 19% fat here, you can see in the video that all the vital organs are squashed up against the dorsal wall. So you might say, well, if you look at the bioax in Kuala Lumpur or Bangkok or Colombo, they're like great lumps of lard, and they're wild animals. Well, yeah, they are, but they only seem to exist in man-made environments, and yet some of the larger ones are extremely fat, but do you really think that an animal that fat can get its leg over? Because it looks to me like it's eaten itself into evolutionary oblivion. So in summary, I think these capsules have got much too much fat, and maybe the wrong type of fat, certainly the wrong colour. And these, I want to emphasise again, these animals have dissected are well looked after animals. They're not like the ones that, you know, boneheads keep and they just throw them as much food as they want and they just get fatter and fatter and fatter. And if you look at on the internet at people's pet bioacts and savannah monitors, there are huge great lumps of lard. They're much worse than the animals we've looked at here. It's not unreasonable to suppose that some of them are 60% fat, maybe even more than that, but lizards in boxes, you know, they're often, they're items of entertainment for their owners. That's what they're there for. They never get any exercise. They get fed far too much crap food, and like obese people, they are going to die prematurely. Um, so thanks to my friend who gave me these lizards and to various colleagues who've answered questions about this over the last week. There's obviously an awful lot to learn about this subject and it's clearly highly relevant to the care of animals in captivity. So if you've got monitor lizards and they die, cut them open, see what's going on inside them. We can learn so much from it. Thanks very much. Sweet perfumes are made from fat. But not from this greasy cat. There's a fragrance in his clothes, but it ain't like what you imagine smelling a rose. No, the cat is fat and greasy. Very greasy and fatty watty. Greasy, wheezy, wheezy, wheezy. Head to heel, he's fat and greasy. Yeah. Look at the grease going.